On a personal note, I first met uh, Professor DiCredico when I was assigned at, to the Naval Academy to teach in the history department. Okay. And she very graciously allowed me to teach her section of the Civil War history course to the midshipmen. And she also graciously came in to one of those classes and gave a counterpoint to my overwhelmingly favorable impression of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Back then, 1989 to 1991, that was before, of course, the uh, uh, Ken Burns series. It was a wildly popular course, certainly not because of me, but because of Professor DiCredico. Her, as I recall, student evaluations were wildly popular and quite on point, I would also say. And she is also a native Clevelander. Oh, she is indeed. And she is a graduate of Laurel School some years ago. <laughs> She is back. I recall she was a Browns fan back then. I believe she still, still am. No? Still am. Oh, of course. See, and she's still a Browns fan to this day. Such, without further ado, Professor DeCredico. Mark, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, you'll appreciate this. Today in class, uh, in, in the core, most of my students asked me, ma'am, did you watch the game on Sunday against the Bengals? I said, of course I did. Do you think that they suffer from not having Odell Beckham? And I said, no, I thought Baker Mayfield had one of his best outings ever. Uh, I've been a long suffering Cleveland fan in many, many ways, but uh, I will always be a Cleveland Browns fan. I, I actually have a bobblehead in my office. Um, I'm delighted to be with you this evening. Uh, um, I'm sorry it's via Zoom. Uh, this has become the new normal, I'm afraid. I spent the last 18 months teaching via Zoom and Google Meet at the Naval Academy. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. Years ago, I was invited to give by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, was invited to give a lecture on Jefferson Davis in Washington, DC. And I titled it, Jefferson Davis, Tragic Hero. Uh, in light of current controversies, and obviously my talk tonight is not politically correct, removal of statues, removal of plaques, renaming of buildings. And, and this includes the US Naval Academy. I, I attended a brief with them. Um, and on Michelle Howard, where they, the Department of Defense is going to rename Maury Hall and the Buchanan House, the superintendent's residence, because both sided with the Confederacy. Um, it's a, a difficult time where we are basically ignoring our history, and we do that to our peril. Uh, Davis is a fascinating figure and one that history has not treated very fairly. Historian David Potter, for example, wrote a significant article that in the 19, late 60s and 70s tended to be the last word on, on Davis. He argued that Davis bears full responsibility for Confederate defeat. And that had the Union and Confederacy switched presidents, had Lincoln been president of the Confederacy and Davis the Union, that the Confederacy would have won the Civil War. Historians since have said, no way. The Union had far too much in terms of resources for that to happen. But historians have not treated Davis in a, in a objective or kind, however you want to put it, way. For one thing, he lost. And Americans don't like losers. Uh, they, so it's been, those assessments really do a disservice 
to Davis. Um, invariably, he will be compared with Abraham Lincoln. And that's unfair. Uh, Lincoln had his own problems. He was a micromanager, as I'll discuss in just a moment. But historians universally rank Lincoln as one of our greatest presidents. And again, Davis suffers because he lost and Americans don't like losers. So tonight I'd like to look at a different Davis. Um, interestingly enough, Davis and Lincoln were born less than a hundred miles apart in Kentucky and within months of each other. Uh, Davis's father came from good, sturdy, middle-class yeoman stock. Lincoln's father was a, a hard scrabble farmer with little education. Uh, Davis's father wound up in Mississippi, but it would be his oldest son, Joseph, who parlayed what um, uh, Stephen Davis uh, created into an empire. Stephen Davis had a huge family uh, and Jefferson was the youngest. In fact, there were 25 years difference between Joseph and Jefferson. So really, Davis's father was more like a grandfather and his older brother was more like a father. And it was his brother who insisted that he, and, and actually attained for him an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Davis wanted to attend the University of Virginia and become a lawyer, but Joseph would have nothing of that. If you visit the Confederate White House in Richmond, and his Davis's home office. It, it's fascinating because it really encapsulates the character. On the wall is his commission from West Point, signed by his idol, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, who was president when he graduated in 1828. Uh, he also has on his desk a map of all the Confederate theaters. And I'll talk about that micromanagement in, in, in just a moment. Davis was a mediocre cadet. Uh, he graduated uh, 23rd out of 32 and was almost separated three times. Uh, once for going over the wall to Benny Havens, which was a notorious tavern outside of, of West Point the barracks. Another time for leaving Benny Havens and, and jumping off a cliff and breaking a leg. And he was also involved in the notorious eggnog riot of, he graduated in 28, so probably 27, where the cadets got stoked up on eggnog and basically passed out and started a riot because they wanted more eggnog. That's another story for another time. Uh, but his, his West Point years were, were formative. Uh, he served seven years active duty in, in the army. He was at the Black Hawk. Uh, he guarded the chief of the Black Hawk Nation. And two of the events that he experienced while active duty would significantly affect his career. And they were both related. He fell in love with his commanding officer's daughter, Zachary Taylor's daughter, Sarah Knox Taylor. And the family was violently opposed to the union because lifetime, uh, being a, a lifelong officer, poor pay, slow promotion, you don't wanna live on an army base. And uh, because of just, the. Taylor did not want his daughter marrying into the army. And over time he relented and probably because Davis resigned his commission. They were married and within three months uh, suffered malaria. Davis survived, Knox did not. She went by Knox, uh, her name was Sarah Knox. And Knox was the love of his life and he went into a profound depression and went into seclusion 
on a plantation in Mississippi. And it's while he was in seclusion that he did nothing but read political philosophy, specifically Thomas Jefferson and John C. Calhoun. And he became a Democrat as a result of that. Uh, and he, when he finally left seclusion, he entered politics in 1844 as a Democrat. He was a staunch states rights Democrat in a largely Whig state. Uh, but he was devoted to the union, which most scholars tend to overlook. Uh, when the, the, the Mexican war broke out, he volunteered. He was a Colonel of Mississippi Volunteers and was a decorated war veteran at two battles, Buena Vista and Monterey, seriously wounded and returned to Mississippi, a bona fide war hero. Now, I, I bring this up, his prior career, because his West Point education and his experiences under Zachary Taylor in Mexico, his former father-in-law and Winfield Scott, fundamentally affected the way he approached command of Confederate armies. Uh, Davis returned to politics after the war. And uh, during the 1850s, after Calhoun's death, became Calhoun's successor in a sense. He vehemently opposed the Compromise of 1850. Um, he became the most prestigious and prominent Southern politician in the 1850s. He was the new generation. As I said, he, he opposed the Compromise of 1850. Like Calhoun, he firmly believed we had this, the United States had to have constitutional guarantees protecting slavery in the territories. And he applauded the Dred Scott decision. He, he believed that that upheld Southern viewpoints. Uh, as Davis's most recent biographer has observed, and I quote, no Southern politician had more standing or prestige in the nation in the 1850s than Jefferson Davis. Davis was deeply concerned about the rise of the Republican Party. Uh, he feared that it was going to seriously interfere with Southern designs in the territories that it was going to, and he always couched it in terms of Southern liberty versus Northern autocracy. Uh, he watched the deteriorating political situation in the 1850s with real concern and was honestly psychologically traumatized by the secession of the Deep South, beginning with South Carolina in December of 1860. His farewell address to the Senate once Mississippi seceded was uh, very emotional. He did not want to leave. He, he decried secession, but he had to go with his state. And what's so significant about this is it took the fire eaters, it took the radicals to force secession. But once they had secession accomplished, most Southern politicians realized we can't rely upon the fire eaters anymore. We need moderates. And that's why they instinctively turned to Jefferson Davis because he was a moderate, pro-compromise. Uh, ever the West Pointer, Davis sincerely hoped he would get a military commission, preferably be general in chief. He obviously had higher views of his military expertise than many of his contemporaries. Um, while he was clipping roses at his plantation in Mississippi with his second wife, and that was an interesting relationship, um, 
eight, he was 18 years her senior. And on their honeymoon, he took her to his first wife's grave. I love to tell that to my midshipmen. Don't do this if you're engaged. Uh, he's clipping roses and he gets a telegram from Montgomery. The, the um, Provisional Congress of the Confederate States has met in Montgomery. And in, in Verena's memoir of her husband, she said, the look on his face was so pained, she was convinced somebody in the family had died. And he, he basically says, I've been elected president of the provisional government of the Confederate States of America. And he didn't want it. But because Davis is so honor bound, so duty driven, he feels compelled to accept it. And so he journeys to Montgomery and the journey should have convinced him of the odds against the Confederacy. Uh, from his plantation in Mississippi to get to Montgomery, he had, he had to go via Atlanta. And as I like to, Josh with my midshipmen, this is before Delta Airlines where everything goes through Atlanta, right? This is way out of the way. And, and this should have underscored to him the logistical difficulties that would confront the Confederacy. Uh, it, it's crucial to bear in mind that when Davis goes to Montgomery, he's leading a brand new nation, not an established political state. In fact, when Robert Toombs was approached about where somebody could find the State Department. He said, in my hat. Uh, their, their cabinet positions were in hotel rooms in Montgomery with pieces of paper tacked out saying what particular cabinet position was located where. So, so this is in, in this respect, and, I, and I, I, I agree with his biographer, his position was much more akin to George Washington than it was to Abraham Lincoln. He has to create a nation, an army, a cabinet, everything from ground zero. It's a daunting task. There's no treasury, there are no alliances, there's no Navy. Uh, everything is, is being done on the fly, if you will. In his first inaugural, at Montgomery, he emphasized, and this is going to become his mantra throughout his presidency. He emphasizes that the Confederacy was, quote, the legitimate descendant of the American Revolution. And if, if you look, I, I meant to bring it home with me. I have a, a, a copy of the Great Seal of the Confederacy. I have it here on the wall, but it's a ink and it's not nearly as, Evident, the Great Seal of the Confederacy is significant because it's George Washington on a horse. He is surrounded by all the crops of the Confederacy, cotton, wheat, corn, tobacco, rice. And the motto of the Confederacy is at the bottom, Dio Vindice, Latin, God will vindicate. Davis in the forefront, but all Confederates, in the government are convinced that they are the legitimate heirs of the American Revolution, not those damn Yankees. They're the ones trying to recreate what's correct. Anytime anybody wants to interrupt me with a question, feel free. I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> um, Davis's West Point years and his years in the army and service as secretary of war under Franklin Pierce. He's actually considered one of the finest secretary of war slash secretaries of defense this country has ever had. He modernized the army. Uh, he overhauled the curriculum at West Point with then superintendent Colonel Robert E. Lee. But because of it, it's a, as I said, it's a blessing and a curse. He considered himself a, if not a military genius, at least someone who, who understood the military and could understand what needed to be done. 
And as a result of that, he will micromanage throughout the war. Lincoln is no different, as I mentioned. Until Lincoln found Grant, he did the same thing. Um, but again, if you compare the two, Lincoln had one term in Congress, uh, two years. He was a, a lawyer. He had no military background except for the Black Hawk War. So if you put, look on paper, Davis was far superior to Lincoln. And yet, as the war plays out, we understand that, that no, really, he's not. Lincoln grows into the role, and Davis doesn't. And partly it's because of Davis's personal traits. Lincoln enjoyed, <coughs> excuse me, the hail fellow well-met, back-slapping politics of Congress. Davis did not. He had impeccable bearing based on West Point, uh, was racked with illness, blind in one eye. Uh, he could never tell jokes. He could never be relaxed. In, in private, he was a loving, giving individual, but the public in the, in the South never saw that. They saw this very austere, remote man. Um, he was fiercely loyal and that would betray him as commander in chief because he would keep certain generals in command, generals who he liked well past the time that they should have been kept in command. Who am I talking about? Uh, Beauregard, probably most notoriously Braxton Bragg. Uh, I was telling my midshipmen this morning that Grady McWinney, who's uh, a very accomplished Civil War scholar, decided to write a two volume biography of Braxton Bragg. And after writing one volume, he was so repulsed by the man, he couldn't write another volume. So he gave all of his notes to his graduate student and she wrote volume two. Uh, he was appalled by Joseph Johnston um, who basically said, uh, who, who criticized Davis's list of generals based on West Point graduation year rank and also rank in the old army. And Joe Johnston, who had been quartermaster general in 1861, uh, was ranked, number one was Samuel Cooper, who nobody knows, he was adjutant general. Number two was Albert Sidney Johnston, who Davis considered the savior for the Confederacy. And of course, after his death at Shiloh, that, that was sort of, to Davis, that was the death knell in the Western theater. <clears throat> number three was Robert E. Lee. And number four was Joseph Johnston. And Johnston wrote a very lengthy, heated letter to Davis saying that this is not right. I should be number one. I'm quartermaster general. And Davis responded, well, that's a staff billet. I'm looking for a line billet. And that was sort of the initial poisoning of the relationship. Davis would never forgive him for putting rank above duty. And he felt the same thing about Beauregard, the hero of Sumter who basically went AWOL in 1863 because of ill health. And again, how could you possibly put personal interests above the cause? Conversely, he viewed Bragg as a selfish, these are his words, a selfish and dedicated patriot. And Bragg was a martinet. Uh, Bruce Catton once wrote that the most justified case of insubordination in military history was, was Nathan Bedford Forrest confronting Bragg after Bragg had taken his Forrest cavalry away from him. And Bragg going to his tent and saying, if you were any part of a man, I would slap your jaws and make you resent it, but you're not. And if you ever cross my path again, it will be at the peril of your life. Bragg never bothered him again. Um, 
Many scholars have argued that once the Confederate capital was relocated to Richmond in uh, May of 1861, after Virginia's secession, that Davis concentrated more on the Eastern theater and that he neglected the West. And that it was, many scholars have argued that the Civil War could have been won by the Confederacy in the East, but it was definitely lost in the West. And that's really a, a, a misguided criticism, I think. Um, Davis is a Westerner. We don't think of Mississippi as being the West, but in the 1860s, it was, it was frontier. He understood the significance of the West and he made, and, and Lincoln didn't do this. The only time Lincoln traveled was to Antietam to, to meet with McClellan to find out why he didn't follow up. And then the River Queen uh, peace meetings in 1865, um, Davis went West three times to try and solve this very toxic command atmosphere. He was in the West uh, December, pardon me, 9th, 1862 to January 4th, 1863, October 6th through November 9th, 1863, and again, October 20th through November 6th, 1864. Uh, mixed results. For me, one of the most telling encounters is when he went west and had all of the divisional and corps commanders line up with Braxton Bragg present. This is pre-Chickamauga, pre-Chattanooga. And in Bragg's presence, asked each one of them, do you have confidence in General Bragg? And every one of them said no. But Davis kept him in command. And most military historians and Davis's biographer said this was a huge blunder because Bragg did not have the confidence of his subordinates. Um, that said, if, if you look particularly the way that, that Davis operated in the West, he acted as both commander in chief and secretary of war. Uh, he was making active decisions. And in many respects, that would harm the war effort because he stayed so loyal to Bragg until it was too little, too late. Uh, he thought Albert Sidney Johnson would be the savior. And of course, when he died mortally wounded at Shiloh, that ended that dream. And he never really found anyone to replace John Sidney Johnston. All of this said, for all of his warts, Jefferson Davis was a realist. And from the very beginning, warned Confederates, Confederate population, civilian population, this will be a long and bloody conflict. Do not underestimate the power of the Union. I serve with them, I know them, they will fight to the last. He went to the Congress at the very beginning and said, I want a three, a minimum, I want enlistment for the entirety of the war. And when the Confederate Congress balked, he said, then give me a three years. And they rejected that and finally agreed to a one year enlistment. Now contrast that with Lincoln's call for 75,000 90 day volunteers under the Militia Act. Because the consensus North and South was, this is gonna be a very quick affair, one battle if that. Davis didn't agree with that. He, he knew it was gonna be a long drawn out affair. He also knew that political considerations would force him to defend every part of the Confederacy. Early on, he thought about trading space for time. Maybe I can get rid of Florida. Governor Milton of Florida said, no way, you protect me. You need Apalachicola as a blockading port. Um, he pressed Congress. He only 
everything he asked the Confederate Congress for, he got the first ever conscription act in American history in uh, April of 1862. The exemptions were highly controversial. The so-called 20 Negro law, which exempted slaveholders and, and overseers of 20 or more slaves. Uh, tax in kind, impressment. He pushed for an income tax, which he got. He extended the conscription so that by 1864, any man between the ages of 17 and 50 and well below that and well above that were conscripted. He wanted martial law as extensive as Lincoln had, but the Congress would not allow it. So it was variously implemented and rescinded. The, the final straw. Patrick Claiborne, who is often called the Stonewall of the West, uh, circulated a petition or a, a memorial, we would say, they would say then, <clears throat> in 1864, among the divisional and corps commanders in the Army of Tennessee saying, our greatest weakness is manpower. Why are we not availing ourselves of a great untapped resource? And that's the slave population. Initially, Davis said, kill it. It's an idea that would not go away. And the timing is significant. Davis goes to Congress in March, mid-March of 1865, and says, I want to conscript 200,000 slaves. And upon independence, they will be free. Howell Cobb, who had hoped to be Confederate president, politician from Georgia, wrote a very pointed letter saying, the day you make slaves soldiers is the day our entire theory of slavery is, is false. Because if slaves will make soldiers, what he's implying is equality. And the Congress debated and debated and on finally passed a bill, very watered down, uh, that said, yes, we will conscript 200,000 slaves, but upon independence, they go back to being slaves. Two days later, Davis issued an executive order, March 23rd, 1865, saying, I'm going to conscript slaves, and upon independence, they're free. March 25th was Lee's last offensive against Fort Stedman, which failed and led to the evacuation of Richmond, ultimately April 2nd. The fact that Davis is willing to sacrifice the last vestige that differentiates the Confederacy from the Union, I think is very telling. He has asked Southerners to give up everything, states' rights, martial law, censorship, government control of prices and markets, and now slavery. And, and he is, uh, committed to the end. Uh, the fall, when, when Dave, when, I'm sorry, when Lee tells Davis he must evacuate Richmond, Davis issues a call saying, we're no longer bound to protecting a city. Take to the hills. Basically, what Davis is urging Confederate soldiers to do is fight a guerrilla war. And it's Lee who kills it. Lee says the country will never recover. There will be no discipline. We risk a race war. But Davis is undaunted. And so while Lee is making his way to hopefully Lynchburg to catch the train to North Carolina to hook up with Joe Johnston, who has been restored to active duty by Lee after he had been sacked before uh, the fall of Atlanta. Davis is on the run, determined to make it to Mexico and to hopefully get aid from uh, Maximilian, Napoleon III's puppet emperor to continue the struggle. Uh, 
he doesn't make it. He is captured in Georgia and the Northern press has a field day because Verena is trying to protect him. And so she throws her cloak over him and the Northern press argues that he's dressed like a woman trying to escape capture. He's thrown in the brig at Fort Monroe. He is shackled to the floor and protests that only slaves are shackled, which I think is an interesting comment that he makes. He's blind in one eye and suffers terrible neuralgia. And as part of his, today we deem it torture, he has a light constantly shining in his face. And he suffers that for two years. Verena tries, she appeals to Andrew Johnson. Of course, Lincoln has been assassinated. Uh, she appeals to Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tribune. And between Greeley and some sympathetic Northerners, she's actually able to get Davis released in 1867. He is drawn up on charges of treason and he wants to go to trial to prove his innocence, to prove the legitimacy and the legality of secession, but it never goes to trial. And that really haunts him. Uh, he and Verena will go to Europe. And as I said, they had a rather strained relationship. He lost his, um, no, Dan, there's nobody else. And that's the, that's the consensus. For all of his warts, nobody could have done better than Jefferson Davis, pure and simple. Alexander Stevens, not even close. Howell Cobb, eh, Robert Toombs, a buffoon. Nobody. He was the best bet. Uh, when Davis comes home from Europe, a wealthy widow who is very enamored of him, Sarah Dorsey, offers him a place on her plantation near Biloxi. And that's where he writes his, um, probably the most boring, uh, verbose, it will cure your insomnia, that's for sure. Two volume, Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. It is a tortured exegesis defending secession as being legitimate. And he hearkens back to Jefferson and Madison's Virginia and Kentucky resolutions and Calhoun's uh, South Carolina exposition and protest. Uh, actually, once he becomes an architect, once he's released from Fort Monroe, he becomes an architect, one of the architects of the lost cause. And one of the last things he does before he dies is do a grand tour of the Confederacy with his youngest daughter, Winnie, who was called the, the daughter of the Confederacy. And he's treated like a hero. I mean, he was vile in 1865, but now in the 1880s, he's considered a hero. Uh, he will die in New Orleans and is buried in New Orleans. Uh, interestingly enough, Verena moves to New York and stays there to write his two volume, her two volume uh, biography of Davis. Ultimately, Davis will be exhumed and buried in Hollywood Cemetery along with Verena and they lost one child, uh, Samuel, as an infant. They lost little Joe. He fell off the balcony at the, the, uh, at the Confederate White House when he was five. Um, only one of his children lives to adulthood, and that's Margaret, the oldest. And I'll end with this little anecdote. Margaret married a, a gentleman who had terrible asthma and other lung issues. And as a result of that, they relocated to Colorado for his health. And her last name was um, Hayes. And over time, when, when she had her children, they opted, the, the ancestors opted to change the name from Hayes to Hayes Davis. 
And about 20 years ago, I had the, the, and I say this because I think you'll find it interesting, the great good fortune of meeting Bertram Hayes Davis in Richmond. He was Jefferson Davis's great, great grandson. And the, his appearance is uncanny. He looks exactly like his great, great grandfather. I mean, it's, it's spooky how much he looks like him. And he was at that time an executive with Conoco Oil Company. But what I found so striking, he was asking about my background and, you know, at the Naval Academy and where I was from, how, how, how was I a Southern historian, et cetera. And I said, well, I was born and raised in suburban Cleveland. He said, Cleveland? He said, my wife's from Cleveland. We're Cleveland Browns fans. And I, I thought, I have a friend for life. Who would have thought that Jefferson Davis's great-great-grandson would be a Cleveland Browns fan? So I will pause there. I purposely left time because I thought you might have questions and I'd love to start a dialogue if we could. Uh, I don't know if that's what you had in mind, Mark, but I'm, I'm more than willing. I know I've seen some chats. Well, I'm gonna jump in and uh, help Dan Zeiser who asked two questions. Love your shirt. Your sweatshirt. <laughs> Anyways, Dan wanted to know what what was Jefferson Davis's greatest mistake, and I think we'd all love it if you'd answer that question. Thank you. Uh, keeping Bragg in command. Okay. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and also not. Yeah, I think it would be Bragg, and tolerating Joe Johnston retreating Joe. Staying by Bragg was a disaster. Okay, um, Mark, are you going to get up there? If not, I'm going to ask a quick question. Uh, instead of Bragg and retreating Joe, who should he have sent west? He wanted to send Lee west. There was a huge meeting in May of 1863 that lasted 14 hours. And he wanted to send Lee to Mississippi to take over at Vicksburg. And, and this shows, I think, Lee's short-sightedness. Lee made the argument that the summer heat and humidity and disease would defeat Grant's efforts in front of Vicksburg. And that if he invaded Pennsylvania, it would force Grant to move out of Mississippi. And I think that's just, I, I, don't, I don't know why Lee thought that, except that by that point, especially after Chancellorsville, he was convinced his army was invincible and that if he moved north, it would force Grant to move away from Vicksburg. And that was a fatal miscalculation. A lot of scholars argue that because Lee was so fixated on Virginia and the East, that he did was not aware of West of the Western theater. Recent scholarship is reversing that and saying, no, he knew, but he thought that the Confederacy's best chance was in the East. And he may have been right. I think it's interesting that the only Confederate victory in the West was when Longstreet asked to go west and was at Chickamauga and proved to be the, that, that turned the tide at Chickamauga. That was a tremendous victory, but that was the only victory. Uh, and of course, Bragg frittered it away at, at Chattanooga. Professor, we, we have uh, audience members here who would like to ask a question or two. I sure. have the first question. I'll go from left to right. Go ahead. Yeah, Lee, uh, Davis gave up state rights. He gave up slavery. What was he fighting for then? A lot of people have asked that. He was fighting for independence. And he would yeah, sacrifice why? Why? everything for independence. Yeah, but why? You're talking about at the end of the war? What uh, was he well, fighting? just in general. 
Um, towards, I would say towards the end of the war, he is willing to give up everything for independence. In 1864, he asked Duncan Kenner, who was a very wealthy slaveholder from Louisiana, to undertake a secret mission to Europe. Uh, and that, it, you talk about a very difficult voyage. He had to go in disguise to New York, get on a German freighter, and his mission was to go to Britain and France. This is 64. And tell Britain and France, tell Palmerston and uh, Napoleon III, we are going to free our slaves. Will you recognize us? And both Britain and France said, too little, too late. So was it all ego? How far he's willing to go. All ego? I'm sorry? Was it all ego? I don't think so. I think it was, I, I think it, he was determined to be independent. Um, and, and let me add an anecdote that I think underscores that. In 1970, Robert E. Lee took the oath of allegiance immediately after the war. The government lost it. Gee, there's a surprise. 1975, they found it in the National Archives misfiled. And they had a very elaborate ceremony with Robert E. Lee V, who lives in McLean, giving Lee his citizenship back. Enter Jimmy Carter. Gee, what a great idea. Why don't we give Jefferson Davis his citizenship back? And so Carter ramroded it through. The poor man is still twirling in his grave. He, he wanted no pardon. He wanted no part of being an element of the United States. He died an unreconstructed rubble, firmly believed in the, in the cause of secession and the Confederacy, and willing to sacrifice everything to get it. Next question. Yes. Did um, Davis ever know uh, Grant or Lincoln? And, and if so, do you have any thoughts about either of them? No. Um, he, he may have known Lincoln in Congress in 1844. Lincoln had one term in Congress in 1844, and that was the first year that, that Davis was in Congress. He, he would not have known Grant. Um, Lincoln was notorious, and this is probably why he didn't get reelected. Uh, when James K. Polk, and, and Davis was very pro-Mexican war, when James K. Polk asked for a declaration of war, Lincoln issued the, the so-called spot resolutions because Polk had said, American blood has been shed on American soil. And Lincoln said, show me where. It was the, the disputed territory. And uh, that got him sent, that sent him back to Springfield. They may have crossed paths in the, the Congress in 1844, but, but not Grant. Grant was struggling to survive um, he had resigned from the army. He could not keep a job. Yeah. I uh, they had yeah. Question, please. Next. We're going left to right. Go ahead. I don't know if this might be outside your area of expertise, but my question would be, why wasn't the ordinance 1787, the Northwest Ordinance, why wasn't that part of subsequent statehood you know, for, for the Southern states? That's an excellent question. And, and actually that came up. The Northwest Ordinance prohibited slavery in, among other places, Ohio, um, the Midwest. And anti-slavery slash abolitionists would point to that ordinance during the Missouri debates, during uh, the, the debates over the Compromise of 1850, during Kansas, Nebraska, that was always there. And they, abolitionists and anti-slavery argued that that was the precedent that should be used. And it was conveniently ignored. But no, you're, you're spot on on that. John? Question, please. Yeah, hi. I'm John Fazio. Do you have an opinion as to the complicity of Davis and Benjamin and perhaps other Southern leaders, such as Jacob Thompson, for example, maybe James Seddon, 
in the assassination of Lincoln and the attempted assassination of at least four other federal officers, federal office holders on the night of April 14, 1865. And perhaps as many as 15, there is some evidence to indicate that as many as 15 federal office holders were targeted that night for assassination. Do you have an opinion as to the complicity of the Confederate leadership, including Davis? You know, Dave, I'm sorry, Davis was initially blamed for that. He had nothing to do with it. Um, that whole plot is, is fascinating because maybe you've seen that mediocre movie, The Conspirator. I have my own problems with that. Um, the, the goal was, John Wilkes Booth is a coward. He is a Confederate sympathizer who didn't have the guts to fight for the Confederate army. And he hatched this plot and he got this motley crowd of uh, co cohorts with him. And half of them botched their assignments of, of who to kill. Um, he, to show you how bad the, the security is, he's able, Booth is able to get into Lincoln's box at Ford Theater with his derringer, shoots him in the head, jumps over, his stirrup catches on the bunting, and he is supposedly saying six emperor tyrannus. He's on the run. Uh, Seward is badly stabbed. The others blow their assignments. Uh, the consensus at the time is that Davis and the Confederates are responsible. They weren't. Uh, I think that Joe Johnston surrendering to, to Sherman after Lincoln's death is, is symptomatic. Sherman tells Johnston that Lincoln has been assassinated. Johnston is visibly moved and says the South has lost his best friend. Booth goes on the run. Uh, if you drive to Richmond on 301, you can follow his escape route. Samuel Mudd sets his broken leg, hence the expression, his name is Mud. The family is still trying to rehabilitate his name. Booth is surrounded in a farmhouse in Virginia, shot, um, killed. The other conspirators are tried for treason and are hanged. There is no evidence whatsoever that the Confederacy was involved in any way, shape or form on that particular, on that assassination. Uh, it was a cowardly Southern, pro-Southern sympathizer who didn't have the guts to fight for the Confederacy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here. Mark, Mark, yes. I, yeah. Uh, William, William Vaudrey. Yeah, William Vaudrey asked a question. I'm gonna relate it. Uh, he Thank thanks you. you for your remarks. He's, and you said, quote, he had to go with his state. And why did not, why did he not do as Winfield Scott, George Thomas of Virginia, Robert Anderson of Kentucky, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, John Winslow, and a whole host of people, including Sam Houston of Texas. John uh, Gibbon. Yeah, remain, let's not forget John Gibbon, of course, uh, remain true to his oath. John Buford. You know, this is, um, <clears throat> this is a fascinating question. And it's mm. in, in some ways it's how do I put this? We I say this having had um, Emma Michelle Howard come because we're we're changing some of the names of of buildings at the academy, and and she was very adamant that these are traitors. Mm -hmm and we do not honor traitors. Um, that said, in the 19th century, and I'm not, I'm not trying to excuse their behavior because George Thomas's family turned his portrait to the wall. Uh, in the 19th century, most people identified with their community, their town, their state. There's not a sense, and this is one of the things that you see in the literature right now, there's not a sense of nationalism. It, it's more state-based. Uh, 
And, and I, I see this with my midshipmen. I ask my midshipmen, you take an oath to uh, uphold, support and defend the constitution against all. So what happens if your state does something and invariably every year, I have half a dozen midshipmen say, I go with my state because that's my family. And my response is, well, then you're a traitor. <laughs> and that elicits all kinds of conversation. In the, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, the state was, most individuals equated state with family. Um, you get those rare individuals like Anderson, like Thomas, who, Winfield Scott, who put their oath to the constitution above what their state does. Uh, um, and that's, that's something I think that in the 21st century, we have a difficult time understanding. Um, don't forget that in the 19th century, we said the United States are plural, which is correct grammatically. Now we say the United States is. Uh, Lee's resignation, I can't draw my sword against my country, which is an interesting choice of vocabulary, meaning Virginia, against my family. Um, and then you get somebody like Thomas, whose family ostracizes him because he stays loyal. So how do you reconcile these beliefs? All of these men are, uh, the vast majority are educated at West Point. How do you reconcile that? And if they're not educated at West Point, they're educated at one of the South's military academies and every Southern state had a military academy. Uh, to them, family and state came first. And that's something very, you know, it, it's, it's something we have a hard time reconciling today. And I think that's why the whole monument plaque, blah, 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 has become so divisive. I, I, don't, I don't defend them, but um, it's an interesting intellectual exercise that they went through to come to that conclusion. Okay, next question. Sure, <laughs> judge. Um, Tell me about the election of Jeff Davis. How many people are involved? I'm sorry, I can't hear the question. Tell me about the election of Jeff Davis. How many people voted for him? Who, who voted for him? Where were they from? Who picked him? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, the <laughs> original Congress is the one who chose him in, in, 1860, in February of 1861. When he was installed as permanent president, it wasn't the type of election that we have now. What's interesting, and this is something that I think actually the Confederacy got right, he had one six-year term. They didn't want him to have to be politicking for re-election. Next question. Can yes. I ask? Sure. Hold on. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, I was going to ask what you think should be done about the monuments and the plaques and the names of the bases. Should they go to the names of like George Thomas with a statue in Richmond and John Gibbon with a base in North Carolina? Or is Congress not bright enough to realize that? Uh, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> what, what troubles me is that it's a knee-jerk reaction to certain events, and the people who are making the decisions have no concept of the history. Uh, I'll use the Naval Academy as an example. Buc Franklin Buchanan was the first superintendent, a Marylander, uh, devoted to the Union, was convinced Maryland would secede. And so he tendered his resignation in the US Navy to Gideon Wells. Well, 
Lincoln sends troops to Annapolis so that Annapolis, which is pro-secession, can't secede. Maryland can't secede. And so Buchanan goes back to Wells and asks, may I have my um, resignation letter back? And basically, Wells says, no, you're a traitor. So Buchanan joins the Confederate Navy. Buchanan House was known was not named until 1976. So well past the civil rights era. Matthew Fontaine Maury should be remembered as the father of oceanography. Yes, he directed the Department of Hydrography, but he spent most of the Civil War years in Europe. Um, Mark knows this, Herndon is a, a monument, uh, an obelisk on the yard at the academy that we coat in Crisco every spring and the plebes have to climb up and remove a, yeah, a Dixie cup and put a regular cover on. Herndon was Maury's brother-in-law and Herndon proposed establishing a slave colony habited by Southerners in the Amazon Valley. So the point I made to Admiral Howard is, well, if we're getting rid of Maury and we're getting rid of Buchanan House, then we have to get rid of Ma uh, Herndon. And oh, by the way, let's go to the Naval Academy Cemetery and see who's there. So where do you stop all of this? We're denying our history. It remind, the, the, let me use the analogy. My colleague who is a historian of Japan I, I asked him, I said, Lee, how do the Japanese teach Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And he smiled and he said, well, it's in retaliation for, um, uh, I'm sorry, how do, how do they teach Pearl Harbor? And he said, well, it's in retaliation for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that to my midshipmen, they're like, what? <laughs> And I, I would say the same thing with this. You can't deny our history. It happened. We had a slaveholding society. We were one of three slaveholding societies. It was not the best time, but it's our history. It, it, it's, I, I liken it to now, it's not Columbus Day, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. We're, 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 rewriting history and not for the better. Right. Now I saw a question about Marina Davis. Yes, well, well let's go with one, one more. This is a, have one. He's a Marine, so we have to listen to him. Uh, a, happy birthday if you're a Marine. Thank you, Shepard right. Five. Now my question has to do with when Jefferson Davis is Secretary of the Army. S Secretary of War. Secretary of War, thank you for it. Um, he was one of those people that were pushing the annexation of Cuba to the United States as a future slave state. What do you have to say about that? Um, actually, that was Franklin Pierce, and that was his goal was young America, he called it. Franklin Pierce was from New Hampshire, but he was a doe face, which meant he was a northerner with very pro-Southern sympathies. And what he wanted to do was make the Caribbean or Caribbean a slave lake. Uh, and Southerners were really pushing for this. You have, it's a different definition in the 1850s, filibuster expeditions, William Walker in Nicaragua, right. uh, basically trying to create Southern slave colonies in the Caribbean, uh, in Cuba, and reopen the slave trade in the 1850s because they were there was concern that the price of slaves was getting too high for Southerners in places like Alabama and Mississippi to be able to buy them. Virginia violently opposed it because they were the inter um, intra slave trade. Richmond was the the, the hub. And they were make, they were get, making a fortune in selling slaves from Virginia, where slavery was dying out, 
to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. So that was the whole whole part. You had Knights of the Golden Circle, a lot of different organizations that tried to do that. Interestingly enough, 25,000 Confederates actually left the Confederacy in 1865 and emigrated primarily to Brazil because Cuba and Brazil were the only two slave nations left. And they're still there. There is, they celebrate their Confederate heritage. I'm not making this up. They speak Portuguese with a Southern accent, but they, they recreate battles and everything in Brazil every year to, to commemorate their Southernness. And they wear Confederate uniforms. Yes, they do. Reenactors of another variety. Yes. Other questions? <laughs> Other questions? I have one for you, Professor. Given what's been going on the last few years about rewriting history, renaming monuments, et cetera, can you talk about how it is to teach the midshipmen now compared to when you started a few years ago? You're very kind. You're very kind. It's uh, funny you should ask that because last fall, my department chair said, so what are you going to teach in the fall? I said, well, I thought Civil War and Reconstruction, uh, duh. Um, and in the spring, I teach the history of the uh, U.S. sectional history of the South. Uh, it's, the, it, the interest is definitely there. I mean, it, it's always been there, but now my midshipmen are asking me pointed questions about what do I think about this renaming and, and you know, removing the statues on Monument Avenue and why are they doing this? What is behind this? And last spring, I, I was, it was, I thought, oh, I'm taking a chance. And it was virtual. The last three weeks of my course on the history of the US South, I devoted to history and memory. And all we did was talk about the monuments, removing them, what they mean, what they represent, and it was probably the best discussions I've ever had. And I had African-Americans, I had Southerners, I had Northerners, and they showed a lot more thoughtfulness than the people who were making the decisions to remove the monuments. It was really very gratifying that they were so plugged in. Uh, it is a challenge um, because what I teach is in some respects not politically correct. The Confederacy is not politically correct. Very understandable. There is a question, one more from uh, Dan Zeiser. He would like you to talk a bit more about Greena Davis. And as we know, Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln, well, had their issues. How about uh, Greena and, and Jefferson Davis. Yeah, Verena was, as I mentioned, 18 years his junior. She was a Whig, very prominent Natchez family. Um, courtship, very educated, very strong-willed. Mm -hmm. And as a result, on several occasions, Jefferson refused to take her to Washington when he was a congressman and a senator he basically relegated her to Mississippi. They had a number of children together, uh, but it wasn't, probably their happiest years were maybe during the war and maybe after, but recent scholarship suggests that he had an affair with the wife of an Alabama Senator, Clement Clay's wife. Um, and so that was very strained. And when Sarah Dorsey offered him Briarfield Plantation to write his memoirs, that was extremely uh, strained. They lived apart a lot, uh, sort of reconciled. It was never, at, at times it was a very companionate, um, happy union. More often than not, it wasn't. The fact that she moved to New York really uh, that that ostracized her from the South because how could she, the wife of the president of the Confederacy, 
moved to the epitome of Yankee land, New York City. Uh, she lived until 1913, 1914, but she's buried beside him in, in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. Well, thank you, Professor. Are there any other questions? Way in the back. I, I'm concerned about your comment regarding regionalism because Andrew Johnson was the only federal senator that did not resign his uh, Senate seat when his state uh, seceded. He was from Eastern Tennessee, which yep. was not Northern, but he was a, a, a full-fledged Northerner and he uh, supported the Constitution. Lincoln made him the military governor of uh, Tennessee in March of 1862. He had martial law, he had a brigadier uh, uh, generalship, and this man was really a Southerner, but he was a strict uh, follower of the Constitution in uh, the North. So was he an anomaly for this regionalism business that you mentioned a couple of questions earlier? Professor? I, I would say he is. Um, Andrew Johnson is a fascinating figure. He was illiterate, poor, was a tailor. Uh, Jefferson Davis made the mistake in the Senate of making a, a speech where he just made a throwaway line about, well, anybody could be a tailor. And Johnson took umbrage. And some people think that that's why he was so cr cruel to, to Davis. Uh, his wife taught him to read and write. He was a slaveholder. He was vehement. He, he said all the time, treason must be made odious. Uh, Lincoln appointed him military governor of Tennessee. He made him his running mate. He was a Jacksonian Democrat, pure and simple. Uh, that said, he was also, although he hated the Southern aristocracy, the Southern planter class. And in fact, I, I'm sure you know that his proclamation of amnesty and pardon, anybody, who, any Southerner who owned $20,000 or more of property had to come to Washington in person and seek his pardon. And he was stunned at the, the, the long line of Southerners who did just that, who, who stroked his ego. Uh, his proclamation of amnesty and pardon was no different from Lincoln's. Uh, where Johnson, he, he hated wealthy Southerners, but he hated wealthy Northerners every bit as much. And that's largely how he had a falling out with the radicals, because people like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens were wealthy. Uh, he was obstinate. He made the mistake, th this, this is the critical mistake that he made. Well, he was drunk at Lincoln's second inaugural. But in the 1866 midterm elections, he went on the stump to, to push for, he had, he had vetoed the Civil Rights Act, he had vetoed the Freedmen's Bureau Bill. And he went on the stump and he compared himself, and you don't do this in 19th century evangelical America, he compared himself to Jesus Christ oh. and said radicals Republicans were crucifying him. And he asked for a landslide victory. And yeah, he got it, a, a landslide Democratic victory. And that pretty much sealed his presidency. So from 1867 on, the radicals are saying, OK, how can we impeach him? How can we get rid of him? And that's exactly what they did. Thank you. I think that's all the questions we have time for, one Professor. More. Uh, one more? Yeah. All right, one more. This is a little bit off the topic, but I went into a book by Hank Hayes about the Black Church. Right, I went wrong. Yeah, you, you know, might want to talk up here. I'm reading a book now by a guy named Gates about the Black Church, and within that book, they say that Abraham Lincoln actually was complaining, although he relented at the end, to send the slaves to the Middle East, to the Caribbean or back to Africa, that he was not actually interested in having them stay here. Can you comment, That's Professor? True. Yeah, I mean, one of the great emancipator was a racist, but so is every other 19th century American. Uh, Lincoln was anti-slavery, which is a big difference from being an abolitionist, morally opposed to the institution, but 
does not believe in total political, economic, social equality. Lincoln actually told Frederick Douglass and a delegation of African Americans, the White House, and I'll be blunt, our races can't live together. We can't get along. You need to go away. And his solution was Liberia and Jamaica. Several hundred former slaves did go to Liberia. The problem is they're not African, they're African American. And the experiment failed colossally. Um, I think that the tragedy is that if, if Lincoln had a plan for the freed slaves beyond emancipation, he took it to his grave. And I'm seeing this increasingly in scholarship by he freed four and a half million people with no plan, none. And, and reconstruction, except for the Freedmen's Bureau, did not address that. And that's one of the real tragedies of the war. Uh, you know, what, 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 what experience do they have other than toiling in ag agriculture? Which is why after emancipation, the slaves don't leave the South, they stay. That's the origin of sharecropping. You don't have, uh, have the African-American community leaving the South until the Great Migration in 1914. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that's all for our questions. Yes, and we appreciate your time, Professor, and we very much appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I've so enjoyed this. <laughs>